Now, in continuation with the series of the questions, how to arrive at a diagnosis, the clinically oriented questions, this would be the another video about how to arrive at a diagnosis. So today I have taken up a case from ENT surgery or anatomy, or you can just consider in one question. We will be just showing you how to arrive at a diagnosis and how to answer the questions. Now, this is a question which has been framed that a young patient had follicle lights around his nose. After a few days, he developed fever along with headache and blurred vision. Most likely, it is a result of infection of. The options given are cephanoid sinus, inferior petrosal sinus, mastoid sinus, and cavernous sinus. Now, a very easy question with not much of a difficulty level. And here we have got follicle, folliculites, inflammation of the follicles, and at what area? Around the nose. And then which is followed by the development of fever along with headache and blurred vision. Now, siphonoid sinus, inferior petrosal sinus, mastoid sinus, and cavern sinus. Among them, the mastoid sinus is an air sinus. And the inferior petrosal and the cavernous sinus are venous sinuses. So there are two types of sinuses, the venous sinus and the air sinuses. And as far as our knowledge is concerned about ENT, about anatomy, surgical anatomy, you know that there is this cavernous sinus, which is a very important sinus. And we will be just dealing with this question over here. Now, this cavernous sinus is one of the important venous sinuses, which is characterized by having an affection that there is this dangerous area of face around the nose and in the middle over here. So this is the dangerous area of the nose and this can be followed by inflammatory signs, followed by headache as is written in the questions, followed by development of fever and basically the infection from the follicles around the nose. So this is important because what is this cavernous sinus? It causes a septic type of thrombosis which we give the name as cavernous sinus thrombosis which can be benign in the onset and which can be clinically becoming more malignant, I mean to say more severe. So what is this? It is a basically a bacterial infection in most of the cases from follicles and the most common organisms involved may be staph aureus. Very important or streptococcus so that is important and how does a patient with cavernous sinus thrombosis present basically first of all inflammation and pain around the nose which can be followed by proptosis vision loss papilledema and ophthalmoplegia so there is a wide and a diverse range of symptomatology which you can see in patients with cavernous sinus thrombosis. In my question, I go back to the question, I have mentioned fever, headache and blurred vision. So in addition to that, we can be having what I just mentioned, proptosis, total vision loss or papilledema and ophthalmoplegia. So the variation of symptomatology given by the examiner can be there. So it is not different, only you can be having a one subset of symptoms, multiple subset of symptoms. Now in action now, coming back, you are not only asked how to arrive at the diagnosis of cavernous sinus thrombosis. First of all, you have to know what this cavernous sinus is. So a bit of a brief surgical anatomy about the cavernous sinus, which is a spongy venous sinus bilaterally present. And so it's a spongy period and dangerous. Why dangerous? Because it has got multiple communications. It communicates with a multiple group of veins and that I will be coming up subsequently. So very important, multiple connections and location is very intricate that it is located near the pituitary fossa. Very important. So over here, this is a diagram which I would just like to show you in the first. This is the cavernous science of one side. As you can see, the blue area is the cavernous science and what makes it very important, surgically very important, medically very important is because of the fact that you can see that there are multiple nerves which lie within the walls of the cavernous science. As you can see over here, this is the oc oculomotor nerve. So this is the oculomotor nerve over here, which lies in the lateral wall of cavernous sinus, followed by the cranial nerve 4, the trochlear nerve. And you can see 
the abducens nerve which is the cranial nerve 6 so cranial nerve 3 4 and 6 lie within the lateral wall of cavernous size in addition to what in addition to the ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve and the maxillary division of the trigeminal nerve so four important nerves lie within the lateral wall of the cavernous size in addition to internal carotid artery which lies within the substance of the cavernous science and to be more specific the abducens nerves also lies within the substance of the cavernous science while the other nerves lie within the lateral wall of the cavernous science so this is important and in here uh, this is how the anatomy and the configuration of the cavernous science looks like and you can be asked an image based question on this thing as well so as i was mentioning spongy Paired, dangerous because of the location and criticality because of being like adjacent to the pituitary fossa. So, what are the contents in the lateral wall of cavern size, maxillary nerve, oculomotor nerve, ophthalmic nerve, trigeminal ganglia, and trochlear nerve, which I've just mentioned. Now, after that, what are the structures which lie outside the sinus? That's important. You can see spearly is the optic tract, the internal carotid artery, which I showed as a content and the anterior perforated substance. Inferiorly is the foramen lacerum, medially is the pituitary gland. So in the middle is the pituitary gland and on sides of the pituitary gland on both sides lie the paired cavernous signs. And there's one important thing that these two cavernous sciences of both sides are also connected with each other, which I will be coming subsequently. So laterally is the temporal lobe of the cerebrum with the uncus and anteriorly is the superior orbital fissure and the apex of the orbit posteriorly is the apex of the petrous temporal bone so these are some of the important significant clinical uh, relations of the cavernous science now structures which pass through the center i mentioned you you saw the internal carotid artery and the abducens nerve in the center of the science and this cavernous science from bosses is usually as a result from the dangerous area of a face which i just to told you what it means and then you can see that there is oculomotor nerve in case there's an aneurysm of the internal carotid artery it can compress the oculomotor nerve causing proptosis so that can be a clinical manifestation uh, in uh, some of the cases as well again you have to remember the image based question the diagram what lies with the lateral wall what lies in the center the location of the cavernous signs that's important now as far as the communication this is a very important science and inflammation of many veins over here can cause cavernous signs thrombosis and what predisposes to cavernous signs thrombosis it is some of the procoagulant conditions as you can you must be knowing from your knowledge of hematology protein c deficiency protein s deficiency homocystinuria sometimes immo immobility and high dose estrogen high dose tamoxifen many other drugs which are prothrombotic they can predispose and cause more severe type of cavernous science thrombosis and that's important but how here you have to remember the communications that the communication of the cavernous science are that it is connected with multiple sinuses it can drain into transverse science to superior petrosal science and into the internal jugular vein through inferior petrosal science and the venous plexus around the internal carotid artery into the pterygoid plexus of veins through emissary veins into the facial vein through superior ophthalmic vein and this is the root of disease from the infection from the dangerous area of face and communication between two I told is a paired science and anterior and posterior intercavernous science so inflammation or infection from one science from right side can go into the left side from left side why vice versa into the right side so you can see there's a group of a rich group of communications between the venous sinuses which communicate with the cavernous science thrombosis and experts diagnose this cavernous science thrombosis by virtue of multiple diagnostic techniques in addition to the history in addition to the clinical presentation of the patient and what are they mri magnetic resonance ven venography ct scan blood culture in some of the cases can help and just help you in diagnosis these are supplementary techniques in addition to what i have already mentioned and then you have to remember that this condition is to be recognized early because it can lead to uh, spread of infection and cause septicemia and you have to urgently and start the antibiotics preferably the intravenous antibiotics at a very early stage and a broad spectrum antibiotic in the form of vancomycin or uh, 
can be given. Uh, there is a range of uh, antibiotics which can be given, but you cannot sometimes wait for blood cultures. So you have to start IV antibiotics at a very early stage. So then steroids, in many cases, they reduce the inflammation. They are given under expert and uh, supervised, supervised conditions. Steroids are not to be given in all cases of cancer science thrombosis. This may be taken care of. And sometimes anticoagulants in the form of heparin, they are needed at a defined value. So you have to come to the uh, diagnosis um, of the cavernous science thrombosis, know the conditions which predispose to it, know the presentations of the cavernous science thrombosis, and very important about the communications which are frequently asked in your anatomy or surgical anatomy and ENT. I hope that this helps you a lot. Thanks a lot.